Welcome back to the Petronards podcast. I'm your host, Trisha Curtis. I am the CEO of Petronards. This is episode 12 of the Petronards podcast. It is Sunday, April, is it 18th? April 18th. Um, and this is a bit of a unique podcast episode. You'll notice that Ethan Bellamy is not here. He couldn't be with us today. But I have a our first guest and our first real sort of interview of the Petronards podcast. And this is my friend, uh, Louis Baltimore, and he's going to introduce us to the company that he works for. I'm going to, is it Hylian? Hylian. Hylian. Hydrogen and lithium ion. Hydrogen and lithium ion. Got it. Okay. Hylian is the name of uh, the trucking company. And we've, I want to do this because we've had interest from on Twitter and other folks of, of saying that we haven't covered a lot on natural gas. And that's fair. We, we haven't gotten into the weeds on natural gas. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to actually get into in a way, because um, it's in a way talk about the natural gas market a little bit, um, but also get into the tech of this company, which is really cool and who doesn't love trucks. So um, without further ado, I will let you um, tell us, just give us sort of an introduction of, of, of you a little bit. Lewis and I know each other from a previous life when we both had previous different jobs. Um, and when did you start with Hylian? Uh, Mid-February, I started with okay, Hylian. So, so I'm still, you know, really new but uh at the same time we're a, we're a high growth company uh, a lot of new folks as we uh we went public via SPAC uh late 2020 um and have been building out the team there but uh thanks for having me on the show today um long time listener first time guest so thank you um but yeah just like you know, I've always wanted to hear that so that's really exciting <laughs> <laughs> yeah so just you know a little bit about myself I'm the head of investor relations um for Hylion and Hylion makes electrified powertrain solutions for the class eight trucking space. So what that really is, is the big rigs that you see on the highway. You know, some people call them semis, 18 wheelers, class eight vehicles, you name it. But those big rigs you see on the highway, we make electrification solutions for that. Um, he, uh, you know, heavy duty trucking is, you know, one of the large, you know, transportation, I guess, is the largest or one of the largest carbon emitters on the planet and heavy duty trucking is one of the largest emitters, if not the largest within that segment. So, um, you know, we thought it was a good one to focus on for decarbonization. Um, and uh, we make two products really that um, help achieve that goal. Uh, the first one is our hybrid electric solution, and that is on the road today. Um, we delivered 20 of those units last year. Um, you know, and have built, been building those uh, for, for several years now. And then our next generation uh, product is what we call the Hypertruck ERX. And we've got one prototype of that built. And we've said we will be delivering demonstrator volumes by the end of this year. Um, I'll get into a little bit about what each of those does here in a second, but it's basically our company has one product on the road today and then another really next generation product that is very close. Okay, so let's let's pause for just a second and work this back a minute. So um, what's your role within the company? So I run investor relations. So I'm kind of that interface between uh, Hylion management and the investment community, whether it's Wall Street um, or the retail investment community, which you know gets bigger by the day. Um, I'm the kind of main main point of contact for both of those. So, you know, people would really love to call and talk to my C my CEO, um, you know, Thomas Healy, who founded the company, um, or our CFO Sherry Baker. They'd love to talk directly to them, but they both have companies, you know, a company to run, mm -hmm. and so instead they can call and talk to me. Um, I can answer all their questions. I can tell them about our company, and then additionally, I'm responsible for you know the earnings, uh, you know, the earnings release process. Yep. Um, writing the release, you know, writing the conference call script that management delivers, helping them prepare for Q&A, you know, ultimately dictating, you know, what it is we want to be out, what, what it is and when we want to be out there doing to, um, you know, to market our company, um, you know, and really anything else that might be related uh, to the investment community. And so Lewis has a background in IR, obviously, um, and knows what he's doing. And I think this, uh, so did you drive a Tesla here today? I did. Yeah, so I did. So Lewis also is a has driven Tesla, and I I've, we've teased about it, and I've given him shit for it. But there's not the Tesla is great, like from a from an actual car perspective, it's it's a very cool car, and we've had long debates and and talks about you know the merits of of electric vehicles and not. But the cool thing about this, what's interesting for me about this this trucking company is it's not simply it's not just a a hybrid trucking. It's not just an electric truck. Um, so it's not a pure Tesla or it's not a pure Nikola. Um, which Nikola 
we can argue the merits of that, that it's, it's not technically real, but um, Tesla is tes- technically sort of testing this. So, but your, this truck from, um, from Hylion, mm-hmm. right? Hylion is actually on the road today and is moving stuff. Yes. Um, and it is using, from my understanding of everything, it is using um, both, it, is, it has a battery pack mm-hmm. um, and it is also using compressed natural gas. Yes. Um, or it can, versions can also use diesel, mm-hmm. um, correct? Um, do we know if the, what the breakdown of that is? How much you use either? Um, no, I think it's about maybe 50-50, you know, something along those lines. The, the, the hybrid product um, has, you know, kind of two main goals there. Um, you know, and, and we were talking about earlier that, you know, the use of natural gas and trucking, um, you know, here in the United States hasn't really taken off. Um, we have an abundant supply of natural gas here. Um, it, it kind of works in trucking and I'll kind of, you know, let, let's examine that a little bit here. Um, the first thing is, you know, generally today you've got a diesel powered truck or you have a natural gas powered truck. In the United States, the vast, vast majority of the natural gas powered trucks are compressed natural gas, CNG. Mm-hmm. And they're not LNG because if you think about it, um, we've got the infrastructure already in place, um, you know, from both the upstream side and the downstream side. We produce and we use a lot of natural gas here in the US every single day, but it's really all done in its compressed form. Comes out of the wells, we stick it into pipelines, it's compressed natural gas. We, we, we take it to its end use point. It's used in its natural gas form. The liquefaction doesn't really take place unless you're liquefying it at the coast and sending it overseas somewhere. And I mean, you know, Trisha, how does the context of what we produce today in its gaseous form here versus what is sent overseas in its liquid form? It's, it's quite small, right? Yeah. So, I mean, and that's that's why we th- this is a, a good topic, because I think thinking about what's the what's the market share or like what damage could you actually do from a CNG standpoint? And I think we we probably don't think about also how it's not huge globally, how much trucking we use with compressed natural gas. But uh, India is growing significantly and I think they would like to grow significantly, but they lack some of the infrastructure as well. So just from our perspective, I mean, we produce in November 2019, we produce about 116 BCF a day or 116,000 MCF a day in the U.S., um, of natural gas, so largest producer in the entire world. Now that declined and dropped at the low, along with crude oil production in May of 2020, that dropped to 106,000 MCF a day or 106 BCF a day. And we've since recovered, which I think is important to realize is that we've recovered to 113,000 MCF a day or 113 BCF a day. And that is because natural gas is a, you know, it's a different size molecule. It comes up the well board often a lot easier. Sometimes we're getting a lot of associated gas. We produce over 17 BCF a day in the Permian. Gas in production, for example, and the associated gas in the Permian has recovered significantly better than than oil because sometimes your older wells are producing more gas. The point is, in a nutshell, we have a lot of the natural gas in the U.S. We're exporting about 11 BCF a day, and we've held around 2 to $3, you know, Henry Hub, you know, for for several years actually. And we, we obviously had recent price spikes and everything, but when you work it out in the wash, it's pretty cheap. So from a US perspective, the sort of market makes sense. But what you're explaining is that, you know, we're not using, L- we're not u- liquefying it um, and then using it in that transportation form. So we have the availability to use compressed natural gas because it's abundantly available. It's abundantly available. And so you have really two main options here in the US, compressed natural gas or diesel. And, you know, let's say, I want a really green trucking fleet um, and I'm deciding between diesel and natural gas. Well, I say, okay, natural gas is um, orders of magnitude cleaner than diesel, Um, burning natural gas in transport, about 90% lower nitric oxide emissions with these near zero uh, engines that they have on the road today and 99% um, sulfur oxide emission reductions when comparing to diesel uh, as well. So great, natural gas is really clean burning and it also can be produced and extracted here in the US, um, you know, really more cleanly than anywhere else on earth. So great, I wanna drive a CNG truck to haul, haul my heavy loads over the mountains that we have here in the United States. Doesn't really work that way. The problem with a CNG powered a truck- pure CNG. Pure CNG powered truck, not our trucks, but a pure CNG powered truck that we can then get into how highly on solves that problem. The problem is, is, is they're underpowered. So you can use it to tow, to tow 
light loads, like if you're Frito-Lay and you're hauling potato chips, those are super light. You can do that all day. You know, if you're Amazon and you're delivering cell phone chargers, you know, everybody knows you order something this big on Amazon, you know, a tiny little bo- a tiny little product on Amazon, and it comes to your door in this giant box with those plastic uh, air filled pack. So the, so UPS, you see on often the trucks, they say, they say natural gas. Now, is that the traditional form of CNG? That is your just, tra- you know, UPS uses traditional CNG, um, you know, and again, especially on those trucks that you see in your neighborhoods, they're not hauling very heavy loads. Um, and that works great. But guys say, you know, ultimately the dirtiest routes, right? That the, the, the greatest consumption of diesel fuel per mile is going to be hauling heavy loads here in the United States. And so you can use a CNG truck to tow light loads or you use diesel to tow heavy loads. And that's where our hybrid solution comes into play. And so you can take a CNG powered truck. Again, it doesn't have the horsepower. It doesn't have the torque that it's uh, equivalent diesel does. And you can mate it with the Hylion um, hybrid electric solution. And what you essentially have there is a diesel equivalent power and performance from a natural gas fuel source. And, you know, hybrids, just like they do in your Toyota Prius, they further improve fuel economy. So you actually have um, an even more efficient CNG powered truck that can do the work of a diesel. And oh. Why is okay? I don't mean to interrupt, but I, this is a, the technical side because I mean, if you've watched Top Gear or, or um, the their follow-on show that's on Amazon Prime, when they talk about the tech on the electric vehicle side, they explain it actually really well. The same this, but this CNG. Why does it not as a the the way the trucks are built? The reason it can't is it because of the tank or what is exactly holding back uh, the traditional CNG without a better what from a power perspective that it literally just can't get enough fuel I into mean, that it, to do it? It's just, yeah, you know, that that your, your pipeline spec methane, it, it kind of just lacks the oomph that diesel fuel does. And, and you know, and one of the things that makes distillate fuel, whether it's diesel, jet, gasoline, whatever it might be, one of the reasons why it just works so well worldwide for transportation or really anything else is because there's a lot of energy per unit in there. Yep. Lewis and I both listened to the energy transition podcast and um, they, I think the, the, when they were talking about hydrogen, the guy did a really good, one of the experts on hydrogen did a really good job explaining why it hasn't really, pen, it's really hard to penetrate jet like jets, you know, flying or um, aviation or just trucking uh, because it's just hard to actually combat a the density of the, the energy density of diesel in trucking or the energy density of jet fuel and being able to sort of move it. Um, but this is kind of like you're kind of describing the perfect solution and that you've basically grabbed the battery and you've got you've figured out the sort of tank size and you can either use diesel or, or natural gas, and mm-hmm. it's going to give you that oomph and take you a little further. Absolutely. And so, you know, it really just kind of kind of gets you to that next level. And so, for example, one of our, um, you know, partners on the hybrid side is Wegmans, which is a grocery store chain um, in the Northeast. They're based in Rochester, New York. And they're, they're a perfect example because they tow heavy loads, they tow light loads, they like to tow tandem trailers. You know, those guys you see on the highway with not just one giant trailer on the back, but two. Um, they like to do that a lot and they can only do that with diesel. And so they have CNG for their lighter loads and they love that because those routes can be decarbonized or largely decarbonized, made greener. But the diesel is just, you know, it is what it is. They, they have to use that when they when they need to. And they say, and I think this this, this provides a really good example by using our hybrid solution, they can turn their dirtiest routes. So the heavy diesel routes, they can turn them into their cleanest routes by utilizing a um, highly on hybrid drive chain mated with one of their CNG trucks. So again, you can tow the tandem trailers, you can tow the heavy loads and you can use CNG and take a diesel truck off the road that way, which is great. Um, you know, on a cost basis, there's a modest improvement in cost, you know, a modest improvement of total cost of ownership. I saw um, the I saw the breakdown and you guys put some decent numbers into saying, you know, basically your pay sort of your payback period is what, seven years? Um it, there's a you're gonna pay a little bit more upfront for the tech, but the over from a from a fuel perspective and efficiency saving from both, be cheaper fuel and, and the efficiency savings that the overall cost of ownership is going to go down. Yes, it, you know, it, it'll go down and there's two ways to to hybridize um, a class eight truck with us. And the first one would be um, doing it on a new build. 
So when you're building a truck from new and specking it out, you can include our hybrid drive train on it. Um, and that's the least expensive way um, because, you know, it's being done from new. And then instead you can do a retrofit and retrofit, you know, essentially tears out some of the old equipment on the truck. The rear axle, um, you know, adds our APU, adds our axle and our motor. Now, is that ba- is that battery that you, so when you say retrofitting, are you putting in your whole drivetrain and your the new, ba- so you're putting in a new drivetrain, you're putting in a big bat- a battery pack. And then you're putting in your these different fuel tanks. Do you have to have a separate fuel? There's a couple tech questions I have on this, but from the actual battery pack, because it does sound like from what we talked about before, it's really interesting because you guys have a different you guys have a, a different take on the battery thing that seems to be efficient and works with these trucks. Yeah. Um, and that you also obviously different from some competitors. But do you have a separate fuel tank if you if I'm saying I want to opt, I'm going to use diesel more often than CNG. Is that a different fuel tank? Is it, I mean, it's a totally different system. So you either have your diesel engine yep. and then it's mated with our hybrid system, or you've got a CNG powered truck That's and it's mated with our hybrid system. One or the other, it's, you know, your, your big engine on board in the front of the truck uses what it uses. And do you, have you seen a difference in the purchasing of that? Is one in higher demand than another? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's still very early on and, and the CNG is probably really where, where it works out best. Um, you know, if you're adding it onto a diesel, it improves your fuel economy, which reduces your per mile emissions, which is great. But at the same time, you've got a diesel truck that you could use, you know, it doesn't unlock additional use cases right. like the hybridization of a CNG powered truck does. So really being able to say, I can use my truck in applications that I couldn't beforehand, um, you know, it's really attractive on the hybrid side. I'm just thinking of growing. I'm just literally picturing going up rabbit ears pass and my route home and like going up rabbit ears pass as you go into steamboat and the trucks on that and the, in the winter, them parked on the side and they're, you know, they're idling and they're running their trucks and like, it's a big deal in the winter. And it, or, um, <clears throat> Lewis and I have talked about this as well of like this whole concept of you know, not having, you know, especially when you're trucking in the mountains in the winter, not being able to have a pure battery solution necessarily, because you need some kind of, you may need some kind of, or to help with it. But this is a great opportunity, I think, to talk about the tech of your battery that's a little bit different than maybe some peers or how we maybe think about the um, the pros and cons of, of battery technology and, and what's different about your, this battery. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, you know, I don't want to spend too, too much time talking about the hybrid because we've got a you know, really exciting solution coming up next, which is our Hypertruck platform, the Hypertruck ERX that will be um, building more volumes here shortly, delivering additional volumes by the, by the end of this year, um, and then ideally moving into commercialized production for that product uh, sometime in 2022. But, um, you know, really we were mentioning the battery. We don't use your standard lithium ion um, batteries that, you know, is in my Tesla sitting outside here. Um, those batteries are very large and very heavy. And, um, you know, they kind of become the payload to an extent. They work great because they are very energy dense. You can put a lot of energy in them. Um, You know, so if you're charging it overnight at your home or if you're charging it on the side of the highway, you know, if you're charging it in a stationary manner where you've got to pull over and charge it for a while, that technology works better. But our, you know, in both our hybrid system and our Hypertruck ERX, you know, we are we have a smaller battery that we're then continuously feeding power into it and pulling power out of it. So continuously charging it and discharging it um, over the road. And we use a lithium titanate uh, technology there, which is a different type of battery. Again, it charges and discharges very quickly and very safely and can last a long time. Safety is a very big one. What from a obviously titanate, it's it's not um, your your typical lithium ion. So what does the titanate do that these other batteries don't? It, I mean, you know, one of the things that we do too is, you know, we have this onboard cooling system that keeps the batteries um, cool so that you can, again, you know, if you think about when you're charging your cell phone, when it's plugged in, it gets hot, you know, we cool it. And then same thing, if you're using some battery a lot, it warms up. That's kind of big. Heat kills efficiency. For we're talking about trucking because, yes. I mean, the biggest, the thing when I think about just a pure battery truck, a pure electric vehicle, mega truck, you know, that's hauling stuff. Um, and, you know, I've thought about this a lot within discussions with Ethan and stuff, because we we think about, you know, mining and everything. And the reason you're not going to be doing these things with 
big vehicles with if they're powered by diesel is simply because you, you you can't otherwise do it. But a big truck with a battery, you have the capacity one to you have the space, right? Mm-hmm. And so you can put the um, and if you have the power, you can make that sort of work. But if you're cooling that, that's just additional efficiency that you're in theory, that's additional efficiency that you're giving it because it's going to let the battery be used more when you need to use it more. It, it, it works out a lot better. I mean, you know, with our battery technology. So we buy the cells from Toshiba. We package them in our factory. Um, you know, we build that system that cools it. And then we also have this mated with our um, battery management software and our drive, you know, our driving software. These are connected trucks. So they're always gathering data, being it, beaming it back to us. And then through this connected software that, um, you know, is our own, they're looking ahead. They know the train that's coming. They know the train that's behind them and they can continuously optimize the way it uses the um, power. Because, you know, remember, you're never plugging either of these in. Um, they're all generating power really by braking, uh, you know, on the hybrid side, by braking and by going downhill. And then, um, you know, with our Hypertruck ERX, which I want to make sure we get into in a second, um, they're actually also generating the power on board. But, you know, again, we can kind of close the loop on the hybrid. It's a it's a, it's a nice technology. Um, but you never plug it in. You never plug it in. It always generates its power basically that's, via braking or via going downhill. It's pretty big for truckers. Um, but before we close on this, I... I don't want to close on the natural gas quite yet um, because the oh, and, and, and yeah uh, the, the the natural gas is a, it's kind of an involved thing and I want to get into the, the hyper truck thing but it does seem like that both from a the compete you know if I'm thinking of of tr- if I'm just thinking of trucking the the ha- needing to pull over and to charge it up and the fact that your battery packs would be so damn big it would take a long time and it's just not yes the guys can sleep and everything but you have to have so you'd have to have you know I don't even know if if you were a, a if you were a big Tesla truck, you know, are you are charging in a Tesla power super station? There just doesn't seem to be, are there enough one just to charging stations? But from a CNG perspective, we do have a lot of natural gas. We do have a lot of facilities that you can actually gas up at. Absolutely. And so, you know, and that's a big one. I mean, look, I hope I, I hope that Tesla sells, you know, a whole ton of their semi trucks. Um, you know, I hope I, I hope most most others out there do do also. I mean, I think when we think about our competition, it's less about the alternative mobility solutions, and it's really more about the diesel trucks that are being built and sold today and that are on the road today. Um, you know, there are different different applications for the various alternative solutions, um, and we all hope that we can move away from diesel um, into these kind of next generation technologies that are most importantly on highly on side going to work as well or better and save the trucking fleets money. And so when we talk about, um, you know, we can get into a little bit of the economics here in a second. But first, you know, the big thing is, of course, range, right? You know, where where are you going to go? Where can you fill up? Where can you plug in to charge a car? Where can you plug in or where can you fill up with hydrogen today or tomorrow? Um, you know, if that might be your, your your solution as well. And the answer is, you know, you can sort of do those um, other two options if you really, really, really think about, you know, if you really think about it, but with a. You don't want to have to do that in business. This is not a you. This is trucking. You want a very long range. You want a distance and you want to have to not refueling. If you're stopping to refuel every five minutes is going to be a pain in the ass. That, that's exactly right. I mean, so our trucks, um, you know, there's almost 750 um, commercial CNG filling stations um, here in the U.S. Um, you know, stations where you can actually fill trucks. I'm not counting ones that might be on the corner in a neighborhood that you can only fill passenger cars, but truly commercial filling stations. There's, uh, you know, almost 750 of them today. And that's about where Tesla's supercharger network was about a year ago. That's a pretty, that's and a pretty so, good stat in terms of uh, just the the number of them. I mean, it's, 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 it's huge. I mean, there's, they, they are everywhere where you can really, for the most part, without having to think too much about it, get from point A to point B and utilize existing, existing natural gas filling infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, again, there will be, um, in theory, they'll be building out, uh, electric charging stations for commercial vehicles. They'll continue building out electric charging stations for passenger vehicles. But today the CNG filling infrastructure, you know, is really quite good. Um, it's there, it's abundant, it's easy to use, it's safe. And so that's kind of one of the reasons why, uh, you know, why we've picked that technology today. Um, 
it's, you know, it's easy and abundant and it's really, really inexpensive. Natural gas is a lot cheaper on a gallon equivalent basis compared to gasoline or diesel. And this, so the reason, one of the interests I had in having Lewis on the show is because not, I mean, one, we aren't, we aren't anti-renewables by any means, but um, the tech of it is really cool. And I think that a lot of folks, when you're thinking about, and this, you know, Lewis is working for a company, so these, these are not necessarily his views, but mine is that when you're thinking about the energy transition and you're thinking about what to actually invest in and what things will work. Not everything will work. Not, you know, we're seeing major, you know, concerns and issues, obviously, with Chinese solar panels and all kinds of issues like that. But things that are working that you can, you know, combine together and things, especially when you have the domestic production of natural gas and it is cheap and it is abundant and you have the infrastructure and you could grow it. And it actually fits in the whole framework of reducing carbon, not just NOx and SOx, but reducing carbon emissions. It's kind of the it's a win-win in a, in a lot of different ways. And even if it doesn't surge in the next couple of years, it, natural gas really may be seen as a solution, um, you know, in the coming years that increasingly so as folks realize that, you know, it takes, you know, multiple years to build a, you know, a battery processing facility. It takes years to build a mine and it takes years to build a battery processing facility. And that we may be using solutions like this that are really could really ramp up at scale in the near term, um, which could be really, really cool. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, you really, people really like to talk about, you know, uh, vehicles that you plug into the wall at night or during the day. Um, you know, they really like to talk about hydrogen fuel cells, but I mean, if you think about it, you know, UPS, Amazon, several larger, other really large global fleets have made it made near term commitments, um, to natural gas because they can see immediate, um, you know, immediate decarbonization, uh, impacts from moving from diesel to natural gas. But again, you know, there are those limitations. And I think that's really where our, Hypertruck ERX, our next generation product comes in. And this is a true game changer where it kind of all across the board hits you over the head with, you know, gee, this is a new, a no brainer. I mean, you know, everybody likes to, everybody likes the ability to go green. You know, you can put it on the cover of your sustainability report or, or whatever else it might be, but you really don't want to spend extra dollars to do so. You don't want your cost to go up in the context of trucking. I mean, in the passenger space, your, your car decision is largely an emotional one. Price is important, but you're willing to spend more money for some cool features, or maybe you're willing to you know, forego some cool features if you can save a little bit of money, but ultimately you don't stack everything up and just pick the cheapest one. When you're trucking, you know, you're really, it's all about getting goods, first and foremost, safely and efficiently, but cost effectively from point A to point B. If your costs go up, that means, you know, either you have to sacrifice profits or you have to raise the, you know, raise the prices you charge your customers. And nobody really wants to do to do either of those. And so our Hypertruck ERX, you know, you talk about a battery electric vehicle. Um, it is a battery electric drivetrain. So you've got a battery on board or a set of batteries on board. You've got the motor and the motor powers uh, the axles. But what's neat about this solution is you know, people think, what does my car run? You know, what does my vehicle run on? Oh, electricity. Well, no, it runs, you know, it runs on whatever it was used to make that electricity. And, you know, here in Denver, for example, I think coal is what, 40%? It's about the, 30%. 30% of the power generation here in Denver is coal. So when I plug my car um, into my garage at the end of the night, 30% um, of that power is coal. You know, another what? What is it? Natural gas? Natural gas. I think the capping Excel is like capped it at twenty, but the energy content's higher in natural gas than it is in coal. So it's a it's kind of a wonky system. But so, so it's a combination of gas. It's a combination of coal. You know, it's a combination of other stuff. Well, what we decided is what you know, and what we looked at is what if we generated the electricity on board our trucks rather than relying on availability of electricity. So the hyper truck is never going to have to be plugged in either. So the hyper truck will never be plugged in, um, you know, per its design today. Um, the way that works is we've got a natural gas generator on board that generates the electricity, charges the battery and the battery powers the wheels. Um, in this situation, um, it's going to have iHeart natural gas stickers just everywhere. I mean, I everywhere, say. you know, it's, it's in this situation. And you know, what we had talked about was, Natural gas doesn't give you the oomph that diesel does. And so we can hybridize a natural gas engine. But then we went and said, let's look at all the benefits of an electrified drivetrain, a pure electric drivetrain. And that's, you know, like everybody else talks about, 
Um, if you've ever driven an electric vehicle, you step on it and the power is there. Mm-hmm. The power is huge and the power is instant. You know, you're not shifting you gears form- and shifting formula, gears. You've got the electric Formula One. It's why you have like awesome electric. Car. It's why you drive the Tesla. I mean, it's a fun car. I mean, it's, you know, Mike, I, I joke, you know, I have the performance model, um, you know, talk about emotional decisions. I joke that at any <laughs> at any given time, my car, you know, not not the Porsche next to me, but you know, my car is the fastest car on the road. Yeah. And that's because, you know, a lot of the weather, as long as the weather is good, as long um, as the weather cooperates, that's a great point. As long as the weather cooperates, it's you're, you're in good position. And so, you know, that electric drivetrain is, 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 is really nice. Um, and so the hypertruck generates the power on board. Um, so again, you know, we talked about those, you know, and that's got a range in excess of a thousand miles. And then also, you know, what we talk about with our truck is this one, Um, you know, it has the ability to go battery only for, you know, as designed today, about 25 miles. So if there's a battery, you're just turning it off. So you're going into a big city or something and exactly. So if a city says, you know, no burning of, you know, no burning anything inside our city limits, we can flip on the switch, go do your delivery, get out of there, flip the generator back on, charge the batteries, you know, life is good. Um, that's a pretty interesting. I mean, especially if you're thinking about um, if you're thinking about regulations and increasing regulations or restrictions in California or places. I mean, that could be or in city limits or something. That's a pretty big deal to be able to do that. So we were just talking about um, the we were just talking about the not needing to you're not fueling up. You can go into a city um, and you can not need to do anything. I want to talk a little bit more, though, about just the tank of the So wh- the hesitancy people had, I would say several years ago, people talked about natural gas and just like I say, a Toyota pickup or an F-150 or something that never took off. And, you know, even with declining natural gas prices, we never saw natural gas take off in regular um, passenger vehicles for a lot of different reasons. And I think you probably saw as a, as a kid, I paid attention to it, but when Dateline or National Geographic did this stuff and a lot of it You know, when it was even, I think they talked about fuel cells and hydrogen 20 years ago too, but always it was like the actual tank, the ability to compress it, the ability to get it, the tanks were too big or they just couldn't work or your truck, literally truck bed would be just one big tank. But this, you you seem to have kind of, one, the technology I'm guessing has grown significantly um, to be able to do this properly. And the fact that it's a big truck makes a lot more difference because you can put a bigger tank and it just is kind of the right combination of all this. Am I thinking about this accurately? Yeah, I mean, what's, what's really changed there you know, what really changed the game, you know, tipped the scales in favor of CNG over LNG here in the United States. You know, we, we had already established that there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure in place from all the other production, consumption and transportation of natural gas. Um, there are pipelines everywhere. Um, but the tank technology just wasn't quite there in the past. The tanks were too heavy Um, In order to handle the pressure, they were like big scuba tanks, which if you've ever lifted one, they're extremely heavy um, and they take up a lot of space. The walls on them are very thick. And so that's what I thought. The walls being really thick. Today, what we're doing instead of a very, very thick steel heavy tank, it's a composite material. So it's, um, you know, it's lighter, um, you know, it takes up less space. And they're ultimately now, you know, it's the it's the reduction in price of that composite material that's made it work. Um, so the tanks now are cheaper and better. What is that composite material? It's some sort of carbon, something or other. Okay. So, but, it, and it's, it, that's obviously progressed significantly in the past few years to make that actually work. Mm-hmm. So it's thin enough, it's light enough, and it's safe enough that this works. Absolutely. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. That was, I think that's a gap that, that could really, that's sort of an accelerating factor. Yeah, us. absolutely. I mean, you know, just like anything else, technological progress, um, you know, changes the path of transportation changes the path of everything else. And it's really tipped the scales here in the U S in favor of CNG. Um, so, you know, again, we had mentioned, uh, you know, almost 750 CNG filling stations with a thousand plus mile, you know, range in excess of a thousand miles. You can drive this thing all over the country. You have to be a little thoughtful about it, but, um, you know, where I'm going to get my next charge range anxiety, as they call it, is, is not really an issue uh, at all with this truck. So you've got the range, you've got the filling station network. And most importantly, with this truck, emissions are significantly less than diesel. Um, and the total cost of ownership is, um, you know, a lot less than diesel, significantly less than diesel um, to the point where, you know, you really first and foremost get to say I'm saving you know, a lot of money moving my goods from point A to point B. Oh, and by the way, it's a lot less, um, you know, it's a lot better from an emission standpoint. So, so you have a, 
Okay. You have a more fuel efficient vehicle. You get the NOx and SOx reductions and everything. And you, your cost of ownership over the life of it is, is less. You do have some numbers. Can you break them out? So if I'm, if I'm a company and I, I kind of want to get into this, this case, cause Lewis and I were talking offline about, you know, why could you see this actually in use in the oil and gas community? Because we, you have an abundance of, of natural gas. And I mean, hell, if people are talking about using, you know, mining, uh, Bitcoin with natural gas, I, I don't, I don't think we, it's too infeasible to see why can't you be trucking your, your water hauling trucks or other things with natural gas as well. And there may be some feasibility issues in terms of the actual, how the, how the truck is situated, but it seems like it could technically work and the operators, you know, or folks within the oil and gas industry could actually utilize this technology. But that, that, those components of this and the, the actual taking on, you know, re, you've, you've reduced your, your fuel costs, you've reduced your emissions, um, but your cost of ownership and the, the leasing because there's a difference from this, right? The actual ownership, if I'm trying to go, if I'm a company like an Amazon or UPS and I'm going to change up my fleet and I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to do all this. There's going to be a sticker price. It's going to be a little bit higher than my other ones. Is there, is this a thing over time? Are we, you know, we think about vehicles on the road, you and I driving, how long, you know, internal combustion engine on the road, how often there's a turnover and how there can be an uptake of EVs. What's this look like on the trucking side, on this, you know, bringing new trucks in and out? What, what's the incentive, you know, if if somebody's got a bunch of trucks and they work, like what's, how old are they? And what's the, what's the swap out thing? Yeah, like? I mean, you know, there's about, uh, you know, globally, they sell a little under a million class eight trucks a year. And there's, I think, a little under nine million Class A trucks on the road um, globally right now. So you've got, you know, a little over a kind of nine year replacement cycle, probably closer to eight year replacement cycle for all the trucks that are on the road today. Um, but, you know, there is about, uh, I think it's about $100,000 incremental cost of the Hypertruck ERX versus a diesel. But, you know, when we think about the economics of, of, of electrification, I mean, anything you buy is going to have a little bit higher, you know, some, some higher upfront cost. But the, um, you know, they pay for themselves over time. So when you think about your passenger vehicles, you know, people drive 10, 15, maybe 20,000 miles a year. Um, you know, and that's a big hurdle to pay back there is if you're saving money on the fuel side, you're just, you're just not running your truck or your, your car all that much. But, you know, truck drivers, they tend to run those trucks, call it 100,000 miles a year. Um, so if you're talking about like a, you know, a seven year useful life, you've got you know, 700,000 miles you're putting on these trucks. And so the fuel savings portion, um, you know, it, it is very significant. I mean, we talk about, you know, maybe a 35% reduction in the um, per mile cost of this truck versus a diesel. And so, um, you know, you think about it, well, higher upfront cost, nobody wants to pay that. Well, the majority of class A trucks on the road today are leased. So rather than the upfront cost that you have to figure out how to finance yourself, um, you sign a lease and you have a monthly payment. And so your monthly payment goes up and, you know, your monthly payment goes up, but your monthly payment on the, you know, your monthly cost on the fuel side goes down significantly to the point where you're saving money every month. You're basing that on, on historical diesel prices, which have been super high in the U S and historical, um, and natural gas prices, yeah. correct? So, I mean, and I, I think that's just an important thing to point out. The reason I threw out those numbers of how much we're producing is that, you know, even with a drop off let's just say we never get back to pre COVID levels in, in crude oil and we're at 13 million barrels per day. We're probably still, we have the ability to still grow in natural gas. And it's just a big, the, the concerns that we're going to see a spike in natural gas prices, I think are relatively muted. So it really makes a, especially for the U S domestic market is a very viable long-term solution. Yeah. I mean, and I think, you know, also when we talk about natural gas prices, um, you know, I've seen some numbers that talk about the commodity input cost for natural gas on the, on the road, natural gas fuel, is about 15, 1.5% of the total cost. So whether there's any processing involved or transportation or maintenance or building of the fuel stations, it's really the input cost of natural gas is only 15%. So, you know, even if natural gas uh, were to double, um, you'd be looking at a, uh, what is that, a 15% increase in your uh, yeah. fuel cost yeah. at the end of the day. So it's also, you know, it's, it's not as sensitive, you know, you also, you also get better visibility into your pricing. This kind of gets back to the whole, it's more of a domestic market because you can't, you have to liquefy it and then you have to transport it. And so we have a massively growing, you know, LNG market, you know, that I think Qatar is taking a huge share of and, and as well as Australia. But when we think about, I think the size of it, and I, I want to touch on this just a smidgen, because I would like your perspective on uh, other 
markets, I know you guys are focused on the U.S., but markets outside of the U.S. Um, and, you know, I immediately think of listening when when Meg Gentle was the CEO of Tellurian and she had made some comments at some conferences about, you know, just the the uptake of natural gas in India and really the market, both from a CNG trucking perspective and the market opportunity for that. And then I was thinking, you know, well, it is a little trickier when you have, to, it, it's cost a little more. So LNG prices have certainly come down. We're exporting 11 BCF a day. We are contributing on the global spot market, those prices coming down, but they range, they can range between six to, you know, 15, you know, um, bucks in MCF. So that that's, it's a wide range. So it's not nearly as cheap as we're seeing here. So it would, it would maybe, there could be some resistance, especially if you don't have it, if you don't have it abundantly available and you're not producing it. But places where you have it or the ability for, you know, if lots of Russian LNG is going into Asia, if lots of US LNG is going into Asia, in theory, the prices will continue to decline over time. And this is a viable, this is not an unviable solution. And for Europe, this may really be, especially if you think about, you know, maybe hydrogen, I, I'm very skeptical of, of anything immediate in hydrogen. But in Europe, I could definitely see this work, this being, um, whether it's completely feasible or not, that they may just want to do it from a NOx and SOx and MPG perspective. Um, the, you know, there, there are also two things I want to talk about, you know, that's exciting about this technology. And the first one is um, the presence of renewable natural gas, which I didn't really understand much about until I really started digging in it, digging into it after starting at Hylion. But that's producing natural gas from landfills, wastewater, um, you know, dairy farms. Um. Literally something that Shep, it's, it's, I mean, we're, when we talk about renewable natural gas, we're talking about anything that's already, you're, you're capturing natural producing methane emissions. All right, so we're talking about renewable natural gas and you're just explaining, I mean, I didn't know much about it either, but in, in all intents and purposes, it's literally renewable. It's coming from natural, it's coming from natural sources and you're capturing it. You're preventing it, from, you know, you're preventing anything, whether it's methane or methane byproducts from escaping into the atmosphere first and foremost. And then secondarily, if you can take that captured methane, then you've got all this methane, what do I do with it? Well, if you can then burn it and produce power, and the, you know, in, in our case, we're producing you know, power for transportation, you can also, step one is you're eliminating it from going into the atmosphere in the first place. And then step two, you're eliminating the consumption of a built for purpose transportation fuel, whether it's say diesel, um, you know, produced from crude oil or natural gas produced from, um, you know, oil and gas wells here in the United States. And so um, you're really reducing emissions twofold. And they actually call it, depending on the source, it can be considered a carbon negative fuel, where they think about basically burning it is better than doing nothing with it at all. I think the renewable natural gas uh, group, I think it's a lobbying group, but they have said that, right? It's basically their, it, it, this is, the whole point is that one, the benefit, you're not emitting it into, you're not, you're not directly emitting the methane, so you're capturing this, and then you're, then you're using it on as a road fuel. So it's, it's many, many levels of reducing emissions. Absolutely. I mean, we talk about, you know, zero emissions. This is actually negative emissions by way of using this in your transportation tank instead of um, built for purpose, natural gas or, or gasoline. Or uh, but not to burst your bubble. What is the, so, so I listened to a few of these podcasts on RNG and was, I know that Chevron, Chevron has mentioned this within their analyst day, you know, in their earnings call, you know, talking about lowering carbon. And one of their methods for doing that is actually investing in this type of, is in, investing in this type of stuff. So it's working that I have not seen them explain the technical components of it, working with dairy farmers and capturing that methane, things like that. What does it cost to do this? So because this is a form of carbon capture. And so and then you're but you have to capture it somehow. Yes. So it's you know that what it costs is if you wanted about, you know, the, the, the clean clean energy fuels, which is, um, you know, a very large uh, natural gas transport, uh, natural gas filling station company here in the United States and the largest, um, you know, largest retailer of renewable natural gas here in the United States. Also, they talk about, you know, they quote, it costs about $20 million to produce uh, a million gallon equivalent of natural, renewable natural gas from dairy farms annually. So 20 million bucks to produce a million gallons. Now, this is what, you know, what do you get for those gallons? Right now, with the various credits involved, you get yes. about $11 per gallon equivalent um, 
for renewable natural gas. It's a lot. There's a reason why folks are investing in renewable natural gas is why folks are investing in renewable diesel, um, because the credit side of this business is pretty big. It, you know, the, 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 the credits really make it work. Um, the credits make it, you know, extremely attractive. Um, but if you think about the economics there, you know, I mentioned 11, uh, 11 dollars per gallon equivalent. Um, but that doesn't all get that doesn't all accrue to the upstream producer. There actually is this idea where, you know, in order to get the credit for the renewable natural gas, that doesn't accrue until the natural gas leaves the nozzle and goes into the car's tank, into the vehicle's tank, in our case, a heavy duty class A truck. And so there's some amount of this credit is split with the upstream and the downstream. So if you think about the numbers, what they've quoted is about 80% of the credit accrues to the producer and then the remaining 20 um, accrues further downstream. But if you just assume um, a 75%, you know, 75% of the credit goes to the producer and then about a 15% of revenue operating expense, um, you get to about $6.60 per gallon equivalent. So I mentioned $20 million to get a million gallons. You're looking at about $20 million to get about $6.6 .6 million of EBITDA um, annually, or it adds, you know, or you're, or you're adding capacity at approximately three times EBITDA on an unlevered basis. Um, there's typically a pretty large leverage component involved with this because, you know, there are long-term supply contracts associated with it. Um, you know, one thing that's really nice about renewable natural gas, as opposed to, say, drilling a gas well, is that it'll produce that same amount of natural gas year in and year out as long as you keep it fed. And in our case, you know, you're, we're feeding it with waste. And as we all know, population growth and we all like to consume more and more every year, um, the waste as a feedstock should at least um at least keep pace with where we are today. It, it does, from a standpoint of just like literally from trash and stuff, it does, it's not a, un, it does make sense. Um, and personally coming from a farming and ranching community and, and growing up around that, and I do love cows. Um, I like to, I love beef. Um, but I also know that you know, a lot of folks are n not feeling comfortable that they're being, um, it, they feel like they're being attacked, you know, for, for in the, in the farming and ranching community because of methane emissions and solutions like this go, do go a long way. In fact, some solutions like this could go a long way in creating the sustainability of allowing farmers and ranchers to continue that um, and continue to produce cattle and beef and letting people actually eat them as a source of protein. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, if you think about it, um, you know, Bill Gates came out not too long ago and said, you know, if we're going to save our planet, we, we probably have to give up eating steak or we have to eat steak that's somehow sustainably produced in a lab. Um, I think he owns economic interests and in companies who do this. Shocking. Um, but basically, you know, guys are saying you really have to drastically alter your life if you want to save the planet. And, um, you know, I take issue with that because we, we like the lives we, you know, we're accustomed to. We like the lives we've really worked hard to maintain and improve. I don't want to move into a tiny house and, you know, drive a little tiny car and eat lab meat. I want to live in my house and I want to eat steak. And, you know, I want, you want my son to have that same life that I've had. And that, that la I think th this is the reason I guess I want to talk about how... I think a trucking company like this, um, and you got you were my first, you know, guest on this this podcast for for a product, which I think is kind of cool. So you guys are more than welcome to sponsor the Petro Roads podcast mm -hmm. if you want. Um, you could be the first, and it would be cool because it'd be like a renewable company. But I think it's also that um, it's these. What I'm very serious about and telling listeners is that it's tech solutions that work. So it's really thinking about this from you know if you're going to go all out and you're going to go invest hog crazy in hydrogen or do things that you think is going to help your bottom line from the ESG perspective or whatever it is. I mean, just for our listeners, EBITDA, I'm not near, you know, he's a finance guy. I don't know if all our listeners are finance. It's earnest before tax depreciation and amortization. Interest. And interest and amortization. Even saying that, what does that actually mean? There's a lot, there's a lot that goes into that. But the point is, is he, you did a great job kind of breaking down those numbers. Um, I just would say that this is a, you could, 
Renewable natural gas is a very tiny niche market, correct? I mean, this is a, what, what's the volumes that we're talking about right now? So, it, you know, it, it is a tiny market and, and we can frame that up here. On one hand, it's a tiny market by volume, but on the other hand, it's actually a really significant market by terms of economic impact. And so, you know, the first one where we can frame this up is in 2020, more than half, 53% of natural gas used in transportation was RNG. Now, that's up from 40%. Half of the natural gas used in transportation more in than, the U.S. was More renewable. than half of the natural gas used in transportation here in the U.S. was RNG. And that's grown by 25% year over year. So that's up 25% versus 2019. And the amount of RNG used in transport um, over the last uh, five years is up 267%. So it's a it's a somewhat small what's base. The, oh, what's the actual so volume? the volume? So you know, and then the volume is you know the, the numbers that I found were that the entire RNG production in 2020 was 59 BCF. Now that's all year. The industry. So it's not made, a day, people. This is 59 billion cubic feet per year, as opposed to 113 BCF billion. a day. So we're talking about a, what we produce in in a half of what we produce in a day. Yep. So all year we made about half of what the U.S. produces in a day. So that that in itself is is very small. But, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, at, at the same time, when we talk about ways to reduce carbon emissions, we say, um, you know, everybody on Earth has to drive an electric car or, you know, or whatever else it might be. But we've talked about how, um, you know, even driving an electric car, you're still plugging it in and, and you're still charging it off power from the grid, which isn't all that clean. But just the... Um, just the 345 million gallon equivalent used in transportation fuel last year. Um, so that's 345 million gallons in the context of about 35 billion gallons yep. of diesel consumed in the heavy duty truck space. So on one hand, you've got a less than 2% market share of RNG in total class A trucking fuel, which shows there's a lot of room for it to grow. But at the same time, um, the statistics there are um, the RNG used in transportation is equivalent to 8.8 .8 billion passenger miles um, of decarbonization. So 8.8, .8 you know, a reduction in 8.8 .8 billion passenger miles of carbon, because remember, it's a carbon negative fuel. So by by capturing this and burning it and not burning diesel, you're really making a big um, impact when it comes to carbon emissions there. Even if, even if, I mean, every, a lot of folks know that I'm, I'm married. If, if I like things to stand on their own two feet and doesn't mean that, you know, you can't subsidize something and then it gets, it gets technologically feasible and costs go down. But I do think that from an RNG and I think from a CNG perspective, I'll come back to my previous comments. I think technologies like this work because it actually solves the solution to the problem. If, if the problem is reducing CO2 emissions and the, them in the atmosphere, this is a solution that solves it. And just buying an electric, a purely electric vehicle and plugging it into your wall um, does not actually accomplish that, not on today's grid. Um, and even, even with today's grid being a the wind and solar that's on the Texas grid, along with the natural gas and, you know, in, in the California grid is, I believe the California grid for most of 2021 is over half natural gas and, and a significant amount of solar and wind as well. And so even there, you know, you're, you're plugging this in and that's half natural gas. So it, these are solutions that could technically actually really help because particularly because you're not plugging in. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, part of this infrastructure bill and everything is is building, you know, people know that it's building out these charging stations. But the reason that is because if you pulled up here and you parked your car on the street, most people have parked the car on the street. A lot of them don't have, you know, a, a garage. And most people who have a, a, a Tesla, I assume, do you, does your family only have a Tesla or do you also have a internal combustion engine? You know, we have a, we, we, we do have an internal combustion. We, we have an ICE car in the family as well. And as do most statistically, almost everyone who has a Tesla has a Range Rover or a SUV or something also. We, we do. And, you know, and my wife and I were talking us, you know, she drives an Audi and we were talking about, you know, Hey, maybe you should get the e-tron when, when your car is up. And, 
you know, she did say, I don't know, you know, can we get away with that? And and I would answer the, you know, I would answer absolutely we could. I mean, I've driven my car all over the place and I've never really run into any sort of charging issues and it only gets better by the day. Um, but you have to be a little bit thoughtful about it. And uh, most people don't like to really think about where they're going to. Well, not in America. Go. And I think contextualize it if we have any foreign listeners, but I just think it's this this kind of trucking company is interesting because it's in a it's we have this abundance of natural gas. It could work in other markets, but it's the technology that you don't have to plug it in that you have the natural gas. And it's one of these solutions that you know if you think you're going to be able to electrify the entire U.S. vehicle passenger vehicle fleet, it's going to be just a harder battle because the having it's not just having to think about it. We were talking about like I I seriously you know David Ramson Wood had done this a lot of these videos that kind of went viral and were very wonky and he was dressing up in different clothing and everything. But one of them he did was when he went to Omaha and it was right after the Texas storm and he went to Omaha and he was just talking about driving, you know, electric vehicles and somebody met him in a Tesla. And so he claims in that the people that met him in the Tesla temperature dropped zero degrees and they lost massive amount of range and they also lost their heater. And I was thinking about, you know, I don't know if this happens significantly and, you know, we have more mild temperatures in Denver, but I mean, do you, you lose range when it's super cold and you probably lose range when it's and and capacity of the vehicle when it's super hot as well. I mean, it, you know, it, in your traditional lithium ion um, passenger vehicles today, you absolutely do. I mean, it's 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 really pretty brutal. I, I say, like, if I'm trying to go skiing up in the mountains, my car supposedly will do 300 miles of range. I think if it's cold and then you add in some hills, um, I'll be lucky to get half of that. Um, I've, I don't think I've ever made it to Vail and back. That's about a 220 mile round trip to and from Denver. I don't think I've ever made it to Vail and back on a single charge. I could probably do it, um, especially when taking into account the downhill on the way back. But that would be um, it would it would make me too uncomfortable to even try because it's, it's like, I don't I I. <laughs> I think I can do it, but the downside to being wrong is, um, is I don't even know. I, I don't know. And you're straight. My, so for, just for reference, and I, and I have a fully loaded F-150 King Ranch and I can, you know, the, it does get, it can get up to 24 miles a gallon when I'm just like cruising and there's not traffic. It's, it's 24 miles per gallon, but it's 200 miles from my place here to my folks in, in Craig, Colorado, door to door. And that tank, um, so I can get there and back. And then a little bit of some. So I know I have about 400 you know, plus miles and it's a huge tank. And that I, I don't need it for all that, but it is really nice to not have to stop. Um, and actually with COVID, when I would have probably stopped more and got coffee and everything, but you just don't yeah. do that. You're not going to hang on the gas station. So how long does it take you to charge? And like when you go home, have you seen one? Does it cost? Do you know what it costs you when you're charging it up, like from your electric bill? And um, what? how long does it actually take? It's... <sighs> If I'm charging it at my home from empty to full, it can do that in less than eight hours. It's about 45 miles of range per hour. And I've got a 300 mile, supposedly a 300 mile battery. So, um, you know, I don't, what is that about eight hours, um, start to finish. So that's not a big deal. You rare, you know, you'd really don't drive it down to empty. Like you do yeah. your, your, your gasoline car, because, you know, again, you have to really be a little bit more thoughtful about where your next charge is coming from. Um, and then, you know, if I'm, and I think that cost, I, I think I calculated about an $8 per tank fill up at home, which is, you know, really cheap. It's, it's really inexpensive. And, you know, um, Excel t charges me different rates for electricity based on when I charge. So that number really is only if I'm charging overnight. Um, you know, if I'm charging at 2 p.m. during the summer, it's, uh, I think, close to three times higher than that. Still very affordable, but, um, you know, to charge on Tesla's supercharger network. Um, actually, just the other day, I was going to pick up my family at the airport and I had to stop and charge because it was too cold um, at the time and I needed more range to get there and back to the airport than I had in my car. So I stopped and I got about 100 miles of range um, at their supercharger, which is they really have gotten quite fast these days. I, it was, I was charging at about 550 miles of range per hour on that uh, charger, which I think was the fastest I've ever seen. And there were two other guys plugged in next to me. Um, so it was, it was really quite fast, but I, you know, I, I got a hundred miles of range and it cost me 10 bucks. Um, so I talk about, you know, about $8 for 300 miles at home. 
um, it's a lot more expensive to charge using their supercharger. And they, you know, they know as well. And so they'll charge me more to charge my car during the day than if I'm plugged into a supercharger at 1 a.m., um, which gosh, I hope I never have to be at a supercharger at 1 a.m. But it's considerably cheaper during during those times. But I can imagine. But it's also it's not one of those things like it's just not. I mean, the, the reason I think it's an in, it's it's super interesting conversation because, you know, I think I think folks from the Energy Transition podcast or, or out, folks not in the oil and gas community might listen to this and say, well, you know, you can you do change your behavior. And I think people will. You know, if you buy a, a Toyota Prius or you have a Tesla, you're going to be more thoughtful in how you're driving and, and change your behaviors and stuff. But there are just applications where you cannot do that. And trucking and like aviation are some of those applications. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I like to think of myself as a pretty techie guy, you know, an, an early adopter, if you will. Um, and I like, I really enjoyed the ownership of, of an alternative fuel um, car myself. But, you know, you talk about changing your behavior. Um, you know, if, if my mother was driving this car, you know, she is not very techy. Um, and you know, she doesn't, she doesn't really have the ability to think about differences in range and weather. You know, she likes to think I have half a tank of gas. I kind of know far, know how far I can go. And so, you know, if she sees 300 miles on her dashboard and she goes to make a 150 mile trip and it's cold and she runs into trouble, she's going to be calling me from the side of the road saying I'm out of fuel, you know, I'm out of fuel. And, you know, to say to her, well, didn't you think about the temperature? <laughs> you know, didn't you think about that? You know, how cold is it outside? Oh, 30 degrees. Come on. You should have known you were going to get less. Like, no, it's you just get in your car and you want to drive. You don't want to have to really think about it. And so um, that's a big deal, you know, for the plug in BEVs. But, you know, again, because our products have this proprietary battery cooling system in them, um, that's, again, you know, mated with our software. Um we have the ability to much better control the environment that our actual battery and motors are in and really mitigate the reduction in performance caused by fluctuations in weather. So, um, so when let's just, uh, before we close this, cause we can do this sort of tech. So when we get, you're in the mountains and it's super cold or when it's super hot, you're in California, whatever the temperature difference, what happens within your truck that's different? Nothing. But I mean, I mean, from a tech set, it oh, can for, cool so it. From a from a, yeah. So the from a tech the cooling and the technical system is adapting to that. Obviously. Yes. Yeah. So that, you know, they, they are liquid cooled. And so, you know, whatever's going on outside, there's a liquid buffer in between the battery, the battery lines and the motor and the outside environment. So, um, you know, my, I think, you know, your, your typical plug in battery electric vehicle, there's some insulation there, but, um, you know, if it sits overnight in the cold, it gets cold and it's in the cold weather, whereas our system has the ability to um, climate control itself so that you don't run into those issues. OK, yeah. And that, I don't know. It just it just seems to me like it's a it's kind of a no brainer from a, a an electric vehicle, natural gas standpoint. It, it just a, it's almost like the perfect combination. I mean, it allows for significant decarbonization. I mean, you know, negative carbon when you're using renewable natural gas. And as we've established, you know, more than half of the the uh, natural gas used in transportation in the U.S. is renewables and that's only going higher, um, you know, but then even when using conventional natural gas, it's still, you know, about a 25 percent reduction in emissions versus diesel. Um, so, again, you know, total cost of ownership goes way down. Emissions goes way down regardless of what your fuel source is, whether it's uh, conventional natural gas or renewable natural gas. And then, um, you know, and your performance is better as well. Um, you know, and one thing we didn't really get a chance to, to, to get into either here, you know, this is really kind of a, an oil and gas focused podcast, but, you know, everybody likes to say, well, that's great for now, but once hydrogen gets here, your product's going to have no more use case. And what's really neat about our product is, you know, that that's not, that's not really the case at all. We, we say it's a fuel agnostic solution. So today, because natural gas works best, the generator on board is powered by natural gas. In the future, as they start to produce hydrogen, and by the way, it needs to be blue or green hydrogen mm -hmm. to truly be environmentally friendly, the gray and black hydrogen produced from natural gas um, and coal oh. today is not is not clean, um, but someday well, maybe it will be. We uh, so both Lewis and I have listened to the well. If you if you get into <laughs> anything hydrogen, you will quickly realize that it's kind of a rabbit hole, and you can keep going down. And I have tried to go into it, and I will continue. But it's one of those things that I believe ninety eight percent of so. 
to, to, to focus on the truck, like I think this fuel agnostic thing is that you're basically saying, and I, if you pull up the company, you'll see in the earnings presentations and stuff that in the future, if you guys, you know, have an, you'll have the ability to go to hydrogen if you want to. Absolutely. Um, so you'll have that fuel agnostic. That being said, I'll be completely honest in that I do call BS right now on hydrogen because I think that in, in the current context, this has nothing to do with your guys' trucking system, but the ability, the technology just simply isn't there because the con the concept of hydrogen is that one, almost all that's produced and consumed at refineries. So oil and refining oil at ref, oil refineries, almost all it's produced and consumed there. So lots of folks in the energy transition community talk about hydrogen as this, you know, this new saving grace. And it is very interesting from a technological standpoint, but as it stands today, we don't have an abundance. We're not one, we're not producing abundance of it. And what we are producing definitely is not green or blue or turquoise. And this whole gray, black, blue, green, turquoise, and, and what it's basically hydrogen does not stand alone. It, it's connected to either oxygen um, or it's connected to carbon. And so you have to take those off and you have to use either a form of energy to take those off or you have to um, use electricity, which uses a form of energy to take those off. And so typically, unless you're using like a pure hydro or pure decarbonized electricity to do it, it's not perfectly green. And therefore right now, it's just, um, we're not producing a lot of it and it's also quite expensive. And I think what was the ones in North American numbers? It's like some, we, there are a couple of North American facilities that are doing it and trying to make it green. I think they're using electrolysis. It was RBN's numbers. It was something like 3.3 MCF a day. Or it was like, it was basically like a third of a Hainesville well um, that they're producing from this. It, it's very, we're talking pretty small numbers when you take it to an MCF perspective. Yeah, it, it's very small and, um, not to you rain know, in your hydrogen. No, I mean, hydrogen today, I think it, I think it produces, um, you know, disproportionate amount of carbon emissions, really more energy goes into it than you get out of it. Um, I saw a stat, it was like, it's produced, you know, it was something that would accounted for 2% of energy somewhere and 4% of the carbon emissions in the same area. Yes. So it was, you know, way above trend when you're looking at energy and carbon emissions, but let's just, you know, eventually there's a lot of work going into it. There, there is, there's um, a lot of money and tech going into it. But, you know, I, I say we're fuel agnostic. So, I mean, it truly is, you know, and not to sound flippant, not that we don't care where the energy is coming from, but if hydrogen gets to the point where it's working and it's being done cleanly, then we've got the ability to swap out our power generation initially for a uh, dual fuel and you know dual fuel engine that will consume either natural gas or hydrogen uh, depending on availability or depending on driver choice and then when the hydrogen fuel cell does um, you know if or when it comes into existence we have the ability to swap out that um, generation capacity with a hydrogen fuel cell which then uses the battery as a buffer and then powers the uh, electric drivetrain that way so the product really um, you know it has the ability to work today and then it has the ability to continue to grow with whatever the uh, power generation future um, yep. throws at us. And as a business, it, it makes total sense. And I, I would, just, I mean, if I was your company or if I was advising your company, I would say that the, I mean, you can lean hard into natural gas in the U S um, I think hydrogen, the first place you would actually see it viably is probably Germany because they're putting so much work, but they're trying to put so much work behind it. I still think from a technological standpoint, it's, it is going to struggle and it's going to actually struggle to be green and folks that even try to do it are going to, the folks that are going to try to get the hydrogen are to Germany are going to cheat on that greenness. But that being said, you know, technological growth we see in, our, in the oil and gas industry, we see in every business that it, it grows. And so I, I don't think it's, it's not that it can't happen for hydrogen. The fuel agnostic thing is also from a, from however the, the government's regular, you know, the government subsidizer credits or anything, it puts you guys in a really good position to be fuel agnostic. Um, it also does it if we are able to export more, you know, depending upon how people view the energy transition and, and realizing what works in the short term and what doesn't, if we do end up exporting and getting more natural gas from not just from us, but from other places to Asia, you know, these are big solutions for, especially for places like India, um, China, where you do have lots of, uh, you know, big industrial places with lots of trucks. This could be a huge game changer for an emission standpoint, not just for we're talking carbon, but we're talking NOx and SOx and local emissions is something that they really, really struggle with is the heavy duty, heavy duty truck fleet um, for them. Lorries is a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, I, I like to think that whatever the energy future looks like, um, Hylion's products will be well positioned to, to capitalize on that. And I think that was, you know, that was, that was what really ultimately attracted to me. Uh, to the company today was, you know, a lot of uncertainty with 
the world's energy future. And I think in whichever direction that goes, Hylion's products will be well positioned. And so I don't have to worry about losing out because hydrogen fuel cells took over, or I don't have to worry about us losing out because hydrogen fuel cells, you know, never really took off. We'll be there either way. Well, with that, I think we are going to close this podcast. We're well over an hour. Uh, this is our first, this is the Petronerds first, first podcast with the interview. So the listeners are welcome to uh, give me constructive criticism on doing a better job of this um, or, or interjecting or, or changing things up. But Lewis, it's really been awesome to have you on the podcast. Um, Absolutely. Really cool tech. Um, love that we got to spend a little time talking natural gas and certainly look forward to the follow-ups. Great. Absolutely. Myself, myself as well. Thanks a lot, Trisha. Awesome. Thanks, Lewis.